You may be seated. I do not have an offering verse. I just completely forgot it. So <laughs> um, if you would, our ushers come forward and receive our morning offering. Gracious and heavenly Father, all that we have and all that we are are from you. Our blessings are boundless, and sometimes we just can't slow down long enough to notice them. Whether it's the love of our family, our home, the birds singing, our friends, we are blessed beyond words, and may we never forget that. Take these offerings, multiply them, and help them continue the work that we strive so hard to achieve. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If Charles would come forward with his special music.
Thank you, Charles. Oh, I have one. Thank you, baby. Thank you to my congregation who are all offering me water and cough drops. <clears throat> Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 37 through 46. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or th thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So I decided to take up what Becky did and have um, two stories today. I found this on Facebook, and I, I don't know who wrote it, but I give credit to the person who did, but it's not me. I'll never forget what my daughter said after her best friend was subjected to a racist comment on the school bus one afternoon. I asked her if she was okay. My child said tearfully, she didn't say anything, so I just scooted closer. Reluctantly, she admitted, I didn't know what to do, Mama, so I just hurt with her. I just hurt with her. It took me a moment to recover from that. I filed those powerful words away and continued observing this mighty pair. Over the past several years, I've noticed how they look out for each other. Whether one gets hurt on the playground, whether one is getting new glasses and needs to have an honest opinion, whether one needs encouragement at basketball tryouts, whether one is frightened by a dog, they respond compassionately to each other's needs. When one cannot have a treat due to gluten allergies or braces, the other goes without two. And when they have disagreements, they look into each other's eyes, listen to each other's words, and work through it. This summer, the pair went to a new basketball camp. I saw their initial shock when they realized they were the only girls. Then I saw them fist bump. They played hard, they cheered each other on, they stayed close. As I dropped my, father's, or my daughter's friend off on that final day of camp, my daughter said, thank you so much for being with me at the new camp. If you hadn't been there, I don't know what I would have done. Her friend stopped, looked right into my daughter's face, and said, if you ever have to go to a new basketball camp, don't worry, I will always go with you. Again and again, I take note of these two friends, of what these two friends have to teach me. And today, I hope the world will take note. I'll hurt with you. is something we can all do when we don't know what to do. What if we collectively look into the eyes of our brothers and sisters 
to acknowledge their story and their pain rather than closing our eyes and walking away? What if we collectively acknowledged our privileges and blessings and would even be greater if we shared by would even be greater if shared by our sisters and brothers? What if we collectively agree it is not your back or my back but our back? If we create a unified and peaceful world for future generations? I think we can all agree there is a lot on the line for our country right now. Unity, peace, progress, understanding, and love are all one on the line. And it's hard to know if they're going to make the cut. But then my husband sends me a photo, and this is what I see on the line at a local football game. Picture a young white girl sitting very close to a little black girl, for they know they are stronger together than they are alone. Let us take note. There's so much on the line, but love can prevail. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, with you, love will prevail. With you, we will heal, we will love, we will be in relationship with people who look different, sound different, live different. It shouldn't be hard because you were the one to make us all different. It's Independence Day Sunday. There are so many not independent. And we ask as we go forth in this week, Lord, that you help us to take notice of what is around us. Have a lot on their mind. They're worried about themselves or a family member. They have an unspoken request. Some of us are just so grateful to feel good enough to get out of bed, come to church and worship you and do your service. And this day, we ask special prayers for Kathy's granddaughter, Anna. She suffers from seizures, but she had a grand mal yesterday. I ask for continued prayers for my dear friend, Stephen Britton. I pray that he is healed and back to normal very soon. I pray for Ken Tomaszewski, who spent most of the week in the hospital and just needs prayers for a recovery. I pray that we continue to pray for Bill Wyckoff, Fran Worthman, our new pastor and his wife as they come to be a member of our family. I pray that we don't forget Pastor Chuck and Ben and Sarah. All these things we bring to you, Lord, as now we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning is called Blessings and Woes. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him, 
because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who will be fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when someone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Story number two. I know I have told you before about one of my favorite authors. His name is Sean Dietrich, and he grew up poor after his daddy committed suicide when he was 12 years old. He dropped out of school at 14. He eventually got his GED and graduated from college well into his adult years. He's a prolific writer. He posts short stories on Facebook daily. He's published several books. He is a wonderful musician, sings, and has recently performed a couple of times at the Grand Old Opry. He adopted a blind coon hound and is the godfather of an adopted little blind girl. I was looking for a story for my sermon, and it was the good Lord helping me out. I give all credit for this story to Sean Dietrich. Morning. I'm drinking my coffee when his photo pops up in my cell phone memories, and I'm thrown three years backward. I remember it all too well. There I am, watching him. He sits on the steps of the shell station, a backpack beside him. His skin is rawhide. His beard is white. His name is Buck. He's from North Carolina. He says he completed two tours in Vietnam. He is not here begging. He's resting his feet. My old feet hurt more than they used to, says Buck. Hard getting old, buddy. There is a half-smoked cigar next to him. He dug this used cigar from an ashtray. Still has life in it, he says. He's sipping coffee. First cup of joe I had in a week. Fella gave me a quarter a few minutes ago. Piled my quarters, my coins together to buy me a cup. A quarter. When Buck went inside to buy it, there were only cold dregs left in the pot. He asked the cashier if it were possible to brew a fresh pot. She told him to get lost. But I'm paying for it, he insisted. She escorted him to the door. So he's drinking drugs, for which he paid full price, for which he is grateful. There are holes in his shoes. He found the sneakers in a sporting goods store dumpster. Buck estimates he's put nearly 800 miles on them. Who knows if he's exaggerating or not. Buck has a flair for the dramatic. Still, his bloody toes poke through the fronts. His middle toenail is missing. Buck explains, God says, don't worry about what you'll eat, drink, or wear. Not believe it. 
But it's hard sometimes, especially when you ain't eating and you don't have blank to wear. So I walk inside the gas station on a mission. I ask the aforementioned cashier to brew a new fresh pot of coffee. I tell her it's for me. I am very polite about it, and she says, sure, sweetie. Ain't she sweet? I buy a hot cup, an armful of snacks, and a pack of Schwisser unsweetened mini cigars. I give them to Buck on the sidewalk, and I tuck a bill into his hand. I wish I had something bigger, but I don't. You would think helping someone down on their luck would make you feel good all over. It just makes me feel like I can't do nearly enough. Buck starts crying. And the truth is, I'm embarrassed to even be telling you this because this story isn't about me. It's about Buck. Buck says with glazed eyes, Did you know that I see God in you? And now I am the one with some major eye glazing going on. I stumble over my words, and all I can get out is, Thank you for your service. I'm a bumbling fool. The words sounded better in my head than they sounded coming out of my mouth. They seem so lightweight. He smiles. He stands to walk away. His big backpack must weigh 80 pounds. Going to Walmart, he says. Going to buy me some new shoes. Going to get me a hot pizza, man. Yes, sir. Just saw God on the street corner. And he's gone. I'm a, middle, I'm a middle-aged American. I've never known hunger. I've never not had a sheetrock ceiling over my head. In many ways, I'm spoiled. I'm lazy, I'm selfish, and sometimes I get so lost in my own self-centered world that I can't see that. But I just met someone, an invisible someone, A man who, despite whatever problems may be, isn't lost at all. A man who knows things, different truths, than I will ever know. Yes, he smokes secondhand cigars, but he also sees mankind. He sees us at our most charitable, and he sees us at our worst every time we tell him to get lost. He sleeps in the open air, counting stars, covered by his military surplus blanket. He prays for heaven to feed him every day. And somehow, heaven does. He is a man who people overlook because it's easier that way. A man who asked for nary a thing. Mr. Buck, sir, today you met a young redhead who happened to have a few extra dollars in his pocket. A guy who wishes he could do more for an American serviceman, but is too ignorant to know how sometimes. So you were wrong, Buck. You didn't see God on the street corner today. I did. So all who are ready, willing, and able, let's stand before the sermon and sing 378, Amazing Grace.
Thank you. You may be seated. Get in good trouble, necessary trouble, and redeem the soul of America. John Lewis made this statement on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, on March 1, 2020, commemorating the tragic events of Bloody Sunday. One of my favorite people in government was the late, great John Lewis. His belief in the freedom and equality for all almost cost him his life. He fought for civil rights to give people of color the same rights white men always had. Then he was elected to Congress and worked for all people. It's Independence Day weekend, and in 2024, not all people have freedom. All people are not free from poverty, hunger, homelessness, illness, and incarceration. On Bloody Sunday, March 7th, 1965, John Lewis led more than 600 peaceful protesters across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma to demonstrate the need for voting rights in the state of Alabama. They were greeted by brutal attacks by Alabama state troopers. That was when it was known as Bloody Sunday. They were so committed to their cause, they were willing to die for that cause. They were willing to get in good trouble. You know who else got in good trouble? Jesus. He was an aggravation and a source of anger to the religious leaders of the time. In the verses prior to today's scripture, we see the evidence of that. Luke 6, 1 through 11. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick up some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man whose right hand was shriveled, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would deal what he if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good? or to do evil, to save life, or to destroy it. He looked around at them all, and he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. Too many laws zero compassion. It was hard for me to grasp stories like that when I was younger. It's only slightly easier in middle age. As a youngster, I couldn't understand men's anger over a perfect Jesus who loved, healed, raised the dead, had boundless compassion, and loved. But what I have come to understand in adulthood is absolute power corrupts absolutely. Bigotry has not gone away. Love and compassion are at constant odds with hate and judgment. 
In the modern age, we are still the same sinners we were over 2,000 years ago. There is so much hatred and divisiveness in the country, world, and the church. We are like the Pharisees just waiting for someone to break a rule, judge someone not like us, and try to not see the sadness and suffering in the world. When did we become afraid to get in good trouble? When did we get so self-righteous that our fellow man can no longer see God in us? As I was trying to find a way to tie all the scripture and sermon together while feeling like death, I remembered something my father did after he quit being a dairy farmer and went back to teaching. He was teaching in a room in the elementary side of the school, but he wasn't an elementary teacher. He got to know a little girl who had next to nothing. Everyone just called her Spider. If I remember correctly, her real name was Elizabeth. My dad knew she came from a poor family. I had already left home, but I think it was Christmas. And my dad went out on his own and bought her some clothes and some food and probably some fun stuff suitable for a little girl. When he pulled into the driveway, she jumped off the porch practically into his arms. If that child never knew anything about God or Jesus, now that she's well into adulthood, I hope she saw God in my father that evening. Maybe in her mind, God looks like a chubby Abraham Lincoln. Because that's what my daddy looked like. He probably could have gotten into good trouble if the school board knew what he did. But nobody ever said anything. Sadly, that child always wanted to hug my dad at school, and he had to try and explain to her that she couldn't. As a male teacher, he couldn't hug her. He wasn't even her teacher. Now, my daddy wasn't a rich man, not money-wise. But he had more love and faith and friends than... Hardly anybody in that local community. But at that time, he was able to feed the hungry, clothe the poor, and show a child what love is. I urge you to look around. Give a smile to someone who looks like their world is coming down on them. Offer to help load a person's groceries parked in the handicapped space. Donate your old clothes to a local church that has a clothes closet. Make a special donation in your offering envelope for gleaners. Visit a shut-in. If you don't say I love you on a regular basis, start. When you see injustice, be willing to get in good trouble. And every day, ask yourself, do people see God in me? Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, we're often not willing to get in good trouble. We are not often willing to step out of the box and follow where Jesus calls us to go. What a better world it would be if we just got in good trouble, if we just saw what was around us and had love and compassion, if we could just love God and love people. Amen. So please join me in the last hymn, which is 672, God be with you till we meet again, and we will just sing the first two verses.
God be with you till we meet again. Enjoy your holiday. Look around. Get in a little good trouble. Love God and love people. Thank you.